what's going on in the world and just because I love talking to you. There's nobody that I want to get on, on this show more right now than the great Malcolm Nance. So thank you for being here, man. <laughs> you got to get some better people if I'm great. No. <laughs> so, but Oliver, before we get started, bigger heroes. we're in the Classic Car Club. We're in front of a Ford Bronco in front of a Gulfstream. Yeah. But as you were coming in, you were telling me about your pretty badass car collection. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, right behind you is a yellow Defender 90. It's a Land Rover Defender 90. It looks like it's a 1997 full automatic. And um, I collect Land Rover Defenders. Uh, and this little, how can I put it, fetish of mine <laughs> started uh, when I was, you know, doing operations in the Middle East. Uh, you know, I started the intelligence collection operations in 1981. And, uh, you know, most of the time I was on ships or submarines and things like that. But on occasion, I would go ashore and, you know, you see these British, you know, British safari cars. That's what they look like. And then they started popping up everywhere. And they are everywhere. And so uh, when I went to Iraq, that was my first chance that I got to drive one around. And uh, there's, a, there's a whole slew of variants of these that are combat versions from, you know, the really slick uh, Ranger uh, special assault vehicles, right? They are soft, Ranger, uh, the Ranger operations vehicles. And then you have, you know, the rare ones. I told you that right. the, the British Special Boat Service operate uh, a Defender 130. That's a 130 inch wheelbase. Uh, with hard tops and everything, and they're so rare. I've only seen one photograph of it, and it had a pop-up minigun in, inside it, and it's like gold to get a picture of these or to get one of them that's been decommissioned. So, uh, so I collect these Land Rover Defenders, especially when I moved to Abu Dhabi in the Middle East, and we had these original factory left-hand drive uh, 1980s models, which you could get for a song over there. I mean, a song is like a few thousand dollars. But of course, they always take out the original V8 and they put in like a Range Rover, you know, 4.6 liter engine to go doom bashing. So your, your, your experience is pretty varied. Yeah. But it also includes kind of this A-team MacGyver shit, putting miniguns in the back of trucks in Libya. Yeah, well, it like, might Libya, I didn't put a gun in the back of the truck. The truck, the gun was already in the truck. Okay, okay. Uh, 105 millimeter recoilless rifle and a Defender 130 uh, high, put the high capacity pickup. And that was the one that I used. I was like, I'm driving that one, you know? So, uh, but there's, there's I've, I've driven Defenders everywhere and I've collected seven, um, I've sold one. And here in the United States, I didn't know that when I started bringing them back to the States, that the, the, the value of these is insane. Um, but I have a very rare six by six. That's a six wheel Land Rover. You Defender. showed me a picture of that. And the, normally Defender wheelbases come in 90 inch wheelbase, uh -huh. 110, you know, four door uh, county station wagon, then 130 inch wheelbase. This one is a 150 inch wheelbase, a Defender 150. And it was a fire tender for the Omani Air Force at one of their Air Force bases. And it got decommissioned and replaced with a, a discovery. And uh, some guy was selling it. I went right over there and imported it over to Abu Dhabi. And now it's sitting in a garage in, in Dubai waiting to be brought to the United States. You're like a character from a movie. Like your trucks are starting up while we're talking. So, you know, this is real life shit, right? But, but you're like... Uh, you're a character from a movie. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause there and let this truck go. Let me let this pause go. You were saying there are no guys like you in the movies. No, there, there are no guys like me in the movies because how many black people do you see in spy movies or, you know, that are in intelligence roles? I can name them all right now. Denzel Washington in Safe House which has, by the way, the worst waterboarding scene known to man, all right? I, I, ran the last, I ran the last authorized waterboard in the Department of Defense before they pulled it, right, after the CIA program. That's where it was taken from, my school in Coronado, California. Okay. So there was that movie. Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman in Reds. He played the retired CIA guy. Right, right? okay. Yeah, that was that great. One. 
I'm running out of them. There was another one which was about a CIA guy that no one can remember because it was so unrealistic that no one would watch that film. So, and then Killmonger in, in Black Panther. He played a special J. Sock Seal guy, and right? that's a reach, right? That, no. No? There's a couple of seals I know okay. right now who are like him. Okay. Uh, you know, including one that's uh, living out that's uh, in Hollywood in California. So, But they just don't exist, you know, and people don't talk to us. And we're also in positions, as you know, when you're in those positions of trust, you don't talk. Um, but I've literally had people come up to me and say, oh, that's all bullshit. Everything you've done is a lie. And it's like, uh, you know, we have a bunch of crazy right wingers that came after me a couple of years ago because they somehow got the impression that I was a member of ISIS. Hmm. And so I got like 50 death threats, you know, boom, all from Breitbart. And, uh, you know, so one of these guys, crazy Jack Posobiec, remember this kid? He's the kid who did Pizzagate. Okay. He yeah, was a yeah, Navy yeah. intelligence officer, yeah. reserve, individual yeah. reserve, who got his clearance pulled after that. Uh, but he and his buddies went and pulled my DD-214, my record of service, uh, and had it, you know, FOIA'd it and got it put up on the Internet. And then I, you know, so I actually, somebody called me. With was, your social and everything else? Well, no, they, had, they, they redacted. had redacted okay. all of, it was like blank, right? Okay, okay. You know, except for my, my awards and my schools and my commands that I was assigned to. But, you know, when you're a cryptologist, all it's going to say is, assigned to a place in Spain. So break, break it down for us. For folks who maybe don't yeah. know your work, oh, okay. don't know you from television, can you give us a, a summary of your background yeah. and, your, and your experience so, as you're able? Yeah. Right, to, what, to what extent you can share or are comfortable sure. sharing? Well, my background is uh, I spent 20 years in Navy, Naval Intelligence, and I was a cryptologic intelligence collector, uh, Arabic interpreter, which means that my job was to collect um, intelligence that came about in either electronic form or when tasked in human form and of course it's all in a foreign language Arabic and you know all the dialects so I'm a graduate of the Defense Language Institute twice basic intermediate and uh, in advanced um, overseas programs uh, and my job was to do whatever it is we do and I worked directly for uh, the National Security Agency, and then was seconded out to other agencies as required. So I spent 20 years on ships, submarines, airplanes, but I was mainly a sand sailor, so I was ashore all the time. And at one point in my career, when I was assigned to NSA, I was seconded out to other agencies. And the first time that I was tasked, they said, hey, we need a black guy that speaks Arabic. Hmm. And so when you think about it, you go, that's a very specific request, right? Because right. we have h hundreds of people who are these fluent, you know, PhD level fluent Arabic speakers and, and academics and some of the, the most brilliant minds that ever existed since Alan Turing. But they're just the wrong pigmentation for infiltrating <laughs> certain environments. Uh -huh. So if you want to collect in North Africa or you want to collect in the Sa Sa Sahel, right, the sub-Saharan part of the of the of the desert or Sudan or Somalia or even Saudi Arabia you're just not going to walk in there with a guy who's just graduated from Brigham Young right and, and that's not a joke because there's no. a lot of guys yeah. what, you know I went to Brigham Young for a dialect course and uh, the CIA recruiter came out there and there was a, a line a block long Huh. Because those guys are eminently clearable, easy to get their clearances. They all speak foreign languages. They're devout patriots. But they're just some missions where, you know, it's not just that we collect, you know, electronically or, or physically. You've got to actually walk from the airport <laughs> to right. your hotel right. 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 without people going, hey, look at that six foot two, blonde haired, blue eyed rugby player, right? right? right. right. Special operations can't do everything. So there is this subset of the intelligence community and special operations, which carries out these special collection missions. And so you're a rare guest who um, I, I believe is an incredible patriot. You've, you've sacrificed and led for this country on many different fronts. But you have the, the rare uh, experience of battling ISIS and the Iranians and Breitbart, right? Yeah. So you, <laughs> That's you, a range. You, you've been in, in, in the, the, the gorilla. The Iranians were easier, the, by the, the way, okay. than Breitbart. The Iranians were easier than Breitbart. Oh, uh, yeah, by far. 
you know those guys over there are rabid uh, because unlike the Iranians they have a they their ideology is corrupted on the basis of real facts which could give them the the worldview that the rest of us see with our own eyes whereas the Iranians are living within a culture and a religion so I can give them a pass so, so let's I, I want to stay on that right? right as we sit here right now by the time this podcast drops we could have American strikes on Iran right, right? The, the president claimed that uh, he was 10 minutes away from launching strikes. Who knows if we can believe anything he says, but we are probably closer to the precipice of, of a new war with Iran than we've been since he's been elected, maybe ever. Sure. Break it down for us. Like, where are we right now, Malcolm? How close are we to war? Hmm. And if there is war, what does it look like? Okay. Well, let me take those in, in pieces and, and give you a, a little more background. Um, I worked the Persian Gulf mission for years, um, which was carrying out collection operations there, supporting the Iran-Iraq war, you know, tasking. Uh, when the tanker war started in the mid-1980s, uh, I supported those operations. I actually went to the Persian Gulf uh, and um, went to the Persian Gulf and, in fact, uh, was involved in direct naval combat with the Iranian Navy in uh, Operation Praying Manus. Uh, what we were involved in was called the Battle of Siri Island, uh, where an Iranian warship uh, was tasked to intercept our surface action group. We were busy blowing up their only really productive oil, field, oil platform there, uh, Siri Island oil platform, uh, which we turned into Siri Lighthouse because it took a year for it to be put out. Mm. And then while we were there, some small boats started chasing us. We had a small boat skirmish. And then this guided missile um, f uh, patrol craft with the last remaining American-built Harpoon anti-ship missile in their inventory came down, with, uh, came down to sink us. And it was a very close thing. In fact, uh, we, we closed within 13 miles of us. And a quick aside, you're going to get a little naval history here. Please. You know, every once in a while, a phrase pops up in, in military history or naval history, um, like, don't give up the ship, or, right. you, know, um, you know, things like that, or I have not yet begun to fight. I actually was present for what will be the most, a, a most amazing phrase that will someday be in gold letters at the Naval Academy. Uh, it was the captain of our ship. I was on the USS Wainwright, and the captain's name was Chandler. And Captain Chandler, as we were closing on the Iranian vessel, uh, with, you know, without any warning, he came on to the bridge to bridge b between him and the Iranian captain. And he said, unidentified Iranian warship, stop your engines, abandon your ship. I intend to sink you. Wow. And I thought, holy wow. cow, this is going up on a wall. Yeah, the Iranians fired a missile at us last remaining harpoon missile it tracked good <laughs> it was coming down on us we blew chaff uh, which is a an, a uh, a radar spoofing device we uh blew we just broadbanded all of our electronic warfare we threw the ship over into a hard turn uh we turned on our automatic gatling gun systems which is the first time it had ever been done in 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 real life close-in weapon system see whiz right. which is a terrifying thing if you ever hear it in in action it didn't shoot because the missile missed us by 150 feet wow. and it was between the hull of the ship and the range that the gun would shoot so if it had fired and it had hit that missile it would have blown us in half and, um, and then we just wailed on that ship and obliterated it. Uh, and then as we left after, with our first naval kill since the Vietnam War, um, we got engaged by an Iranian F-4 Phantom and we shot that down too. So we weren't playing games after so that. So you sunk the ship and you took sank down a plane ship, along the way. Blew up a platform, <laughs> sank a ship, chased ball so hammers, this, and, and shot so, down so, an aircraft. So breaking this down, Malcolm, is, is this what war would look like with Iran now well that's what naval combat would look like with with iran i think that um my experience in the first gulf war is closer to what it would look like if we had to go into ground warfare to a certain extent only without the gigantic surrender um naval combat at that time was 
was was pretty limited because we had complete you know warfighter domination we had the waters belong to us the reason we did that um, combat operation is because they used asymmetric warfare against us we to this day do not know how the Iranians laid a minefield right in the middle of our surface ship pathway that the that uh, that made the USS Samuel B Roberts hit that mine and almost blow that ship in half and only through the efforts of the crew did they save that ship and my ship was the responding vessel and it took us like eight hours of hard steaming hard steaming means your ship is shuddering right because you're going as right. whatever the maximum is and then drive right up to the edge of a minefield and then tr transit to get people off of a sinking ship right that's why we wailed on the iranians because they deserved it everything up to that point was the Iranians attacking tankers, Iraqi-bound tankers, Kuwaiti-bound tankers, but it didn't lead to open warfare. So the, the Iranians learned from that lesson. We sank one of their frigates, we sank their missile patrol boat, we took their last remaining missile out of their inventory, we chased all sorts of little high-speed craft. They decided that they needed a better defensive strategy in layers. So after 1988, they spent the next two decades buying every anti-ship missile China could sell them. And they have hundreds, if not thousands, in their inventories. And they have them, and in, in, in they put them ashore, in shore batteries, on high-speed Iranian Revolutionary Guard coach craft, on naval vessels, launched from aircraft. And these are not jokes. These are missiles that are ship killers. And... Um, they now have decided that their swarming strategy wouldn't just be with these, you know, Chuck Norris bottle rocket boats and heavy machine guns. Those will come in last. They're going to come out with waves of anti-ship missiles designed to overcome, you know, what hit them before, which is a three-ship surface action group, and to defeat our anti-missile capability and get one or two systems kills so that the little small boats can come out and swarm around you with video cameras and show, you know, those 105 millimeter rockets, 20, 30, or 40 of them finishing you off. And that's how the naval side of things could unfold. That's how the naval side of what things about, will unfold. Okay, and what about the air and the ground? Well, the air side's a little more cut and dry because the Iranian Air Force... Uh, the Iranian Air Force was pretty rudimentary when we, uh, when we fought the Battle of Syria Island. Uh, as a matter of fact, that Phantom that came out, it had tasking to find us. And it wasn't hard because their biggest oil platform was a giant, you know, cylinder burning, you know, smoke clouds up to 30,000 feet. So they, all they had to do is go, oh, look, which is a burning oil platform. Ships should be nearby. And, uh, I mean, he came right at us. But... We had extremely long-range missiles at that time. We don't, we don't have them as long. Now ours go out to about 60 miles. But at that time, we had these very long-range SM-6 missiles. And we could shoot out to 97 miles. So while this guy, he, as soon as he broke water, you know, we know what he's doing. He's coming our way. And as soon as he broke water, we were just like, missiles away. We're not even going to discuss it with you, you know? Mm -hmm. And, of course, all of his radar, you know, anti-radar things are going off because we're bl burning a, a hole through him like a laser with our radar guidance systems. Uh, and then we just hit him, and, he, and he, he didn't break up right away. He actually went back to land, and then they ejected, and the plane crashed. But that's how, that's only one aircraft. There were only three aircraft that day. The next time, it's going to be a national-level effort. And one component of this, this is... The Iraqis in the first Gulf War had a deal to take all of their aircraft from Iraq and land them in Iran. Right. This is MiG-29s. This is Su-30 fitter, you know, Su-24 fit, um, Su-24 bombers, um, and some Mirage F-1 EQ-5, very good anti-ship aircraft that can carry Exocet missiles now carry Chinese missiles. And when the Iran Iraq, when we finished Desert Storm, Iran was like. We didn't receive any aircraft. <laughs> they took like 70 aircraft right. and just did not return them to Iraq. Right, right, right. And now those are in their inventory. So they have the capacity to put up with us for a couple of days in harassment fire. But, you know, we're pretty good. The problem is Iran is an enormous nation. Right. 
And in Desert Storm, we had com total air dominance after about two weeks. Because you can't hit every base. You can't get every runway. You can't get every plane. And we had kills. They had kills where they put up MiG-29s and, you know, and MiG-25s and shot down U.S. aircraft. You know? So the Iranians have a good pilot base. They have lots of small aircraft. They still fly the F-5 Tiger. Um, they still have the F-14 uh, in their own version of the you know, long-range missiles. So that'll be more of a battle. Mm -hmm. But if we go in there with the belief that we will have complete dominance in the first day, that's just an idiot talking, and, and that's the problem. So that's the sea. And that's then the we sea get to and the air. air. Now we get to the nitty-gritty, right? You don't, and, you don't even want to talk about Having been on the ground in Iraq, I have a small taste of what that looks like, but compared to uh, Iraq, you know, Iraq's going to look like child's play compared, yeah. compared to what we face well, uh, potentially on the ground in Iran. So break that down, if you can, please. Um, and, 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 you know, especially for folks who may not be as sophisticated on the nomenclature and the language, okay. you know, in, in terms of scope and scale and cost, you know, what kind of a, of a ground force would we be facing? How many people could die? You know, in my, in my 20 years, uh, or actually I should say 20 plus years, I've been engaged against, I engaged or was engaged by Iranians and their proxies three times. Um, the first was in Beirut, Lebanon, uh, when their Amal militia, you know, blew up with suicide bombers the Marine barracks uh, while I was there. And in fact, I was, my ship uh, at the time, we fired off over 500 rounds of five-inch gun uh, at Iranian proxies in the Shuf Mountains there. Now just think about that. There, we were shooting so much, they went off of battle stations and they were just like, yeah, gun crews, just stay on and keep shooting. Mm. You know, I mean, mm. it's, it's, it's almost, it got almost boring. So that was in the early 80s. Then I had carried out intelligence collections operations against Hezbollah on and off for a very long time, almost four years, trying to find hostages in Lebanon. Then I started working collection against the Iranians themselves and the Iraqis in the Iran-Iraq war. Um, and, and then, you know, I, I had this direct warfare with the Iranian Navy and Iranian Air Force. And then I went to Iraq, too. Right. And I was, uh, when I first got there, I was in Basra, which is the south. And the south is exclusively Shia Muslim. There's two types of Muslim. There's Shia and there's Sunnah. Most Muslims in the Muslim world are Sunnah, 85% uh, of them. Shia are that little 15%. But Iraq is 75% Shia. Iran is 100% Shia. You know, the eastern side of the Arabian Gulf, eastern Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, that's like 80% Shia also. and has been historically Shia since the 8th century. So those people stick together on the basis of their religion. So when we invaded Iraq, we unleashed, you know, Saddam was holding down this pro-Iranian population of 20 million people. Right. And you and I, when we were in Iraq, we were fighting the Sunnah Muslims who were the elite leadership of the country and the commando force. That was only five million people. Uh, I wrote a book called The Terrorists of Iraq. I actually wrote it when I was in Baghdad, and it, it's since been republished. You could only buy it at Camp Victory PX, by the way. <laughs> okay. But it was a full study of every terrorist group in Iraq in an unclassified, you know, unclassified book. Right. We estimated there were only 80,000 actual insurgents part-time. There were only 15 to 20 full-time insurgents and only 6 to 8,000 al-Qaeda in Iraq insurgents at any one given time. And, of course, we were wiping them out by the bushel load. Uh, the problem with this is when we made the strategic error of instead of concentrating on al-Qaeda in Iraq, and the Iraqi insurgents who belonged to Saddam's former commando force, the Saddam Fedayeen. I, I recall the very day that the commanding general in, um, in Karbala decided that the Shia cleric, Muqtada al Sadr, the heir to the Sadr caste, they were like the, the religious royalty right. of Iraq, right. and they were revered in Iraq and in Iran. 
And they decided, I remember reading the report where he said, Muqtada al-Sadr is just a criminal and a punk. And I thought, this is bad. Right. You are about to unleash the other 80% of the people in this country on us. And they tried to arrest him, and suddenly these pro-Iran militias came out of nowhere, and the first battles in Karbala, Najaf, Al -Na you know, and Nasiriya, and Basra started breaking out against U.S. Yeah. forces. He became a legend. Instantly. Overnight. Yeah. And, and yeah. well, this guy was revered. All we had to do was let him do whatever he was doing and then maintain the rest of the country. Right. That is when Iraq almost went over to Iran completely. And now their ties are such they needed America to help maintain combat capacity against ISIS and Al-Qaeda, but their religious and cultural ties are to Iran. So by us invading Iran, we gave Iran a new ally. And Iran's ally, you know, a little personal story. When I was in Abu Dhabi, I was living in Abu Dhabi, um, you know, we had a family issue that involved an Iraqi bodybuilder. And an Iraqi bodybuilder. Bodybuilder. Of which and there I are many. Yeah, this, I, this I didn't like this guy. Folks who haven't been to the Middle East. I didn't like this guy. Haven't he been, was, haven't he, been to Iraq. There's actually a very passionate, huge, uh, significant, serious bodybuilding community. One of I my, had no idea until I got to Iraq, and I find out how serious Iraqis are about bodybuilding. And let me tell you, they are, they are champions, man. Very one of, serious. One of my bodyguards uh, who, who worked for me is now, I got him back to the United States, and he's up in Portland, Oregon. He runs a bodybuilding gym. I bet he These does guys very love well. Because what else I did you have to do well. under Saddam, right? Right, just right. Lift weights and break rocks. So anyway, so you've got we this had person. this situation and this bodybuilder, I needed to get this guy out of the country because he was bragging that he was a pro-Iranian Shia militia man from Iraq and that he had killed U.S. soldiers and everything. So, you know, when I got this guy, when I reported this guy to the police and to the embassy so that he wouldn't get on the terror watch list, he went to Damascus, Syria to fight in a pro-Iranian Iraqi Shia militia against you know, Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And so you, you can see that Iran's proxies stem all the way from southern Lebanon through Hezbollah, Iranian forces and Rev Guard forces in Syria. Then that border connects to Iraq, and that border right. connects to Iran, and that border connects to Afghanistan, and it connects to western Pakistan. And there is literally a giant letter C, a crescent, that goes from Yemen jumps over the Red Sea, continues at the Golan Heights, and goes all the way around Iran and reaches almost back to Yemen, right? That's what we are dealing with now. And Donald Trump seems to think, you know, it was Tom Cotton who said, you know, it'll take no more than two strikes. That be they better be nukes. Right. And then what you're going to have is you're going to have people fighting in a nuclear environment with sticks against you. Remember I said that there were only 15 to 20,000 full-time Iraqi insurgents and that the population was 5 million? Right. Iran's population is 85 million people. They are very intelligent. They are very well educated. They know more about American politics than any of us will ever know about Iranian politics. Um, they do want freedom and they want all these other things, but they also want respect their culture. And if someone invades or attacks Iran, they will rally around the government. They have a million man standing army. They have a three million man insurgent militia force called the Pazduran. Um, they have a commando force of half a million revolutionary guards, corps, corps men, who are the core cadre of the, the, of the military aged men every year. Every year, the military-aged men population of 18 to 30s, 18 to 30, is 30 million men. And they have the rifles to arm those men. So they could mobilize 40 million men in a matter of months. They that, can get online with a million overnight. That's what I wanted to get into, Malcolm. That's what I wanted to focus on on this show. This is why I think it's the most important story in America and maybe in the world. We are now not just on the, war, on the verge of potential strikes with Iran. We are on the verge of the closest thing to a world war we've seen in our time.
Fair to say? If the Saudis get involved, if the Israelis get involved, who knows what the Russians will do? This can overflow for decades into dozens of places. Don't be bringing those two countries up because now you're talking talking about very serious uh, incidents. But, But do you agree the stakes are that high? The stakes can be extremely high. I'll tell you a, a, a really quick story because this, this cuts to it. So in the first Gulf War, I was the chief of cryptologic intelligence. My job was all the guys who, who did cryptology under the, in, under the intelligence command for Commander Middle East Force, right? And I was, one guy actually called me a visiting fireman because I was always calling alarm to everything. But I had already had 10 years in this rodeo, right? right. I had seen the Iranians mine the entire Gulf. Uh, we, uh, you know, captured an Iranian minesweeper. We had seal storm this ship, captured an Iranian minesweeper. I'd been in direct combat with them. I had seen the Iraqis strike a U.S. warship with two Exocet missiles, the USS Stark, to the point where it was my job to go up on this ship when the Iraqis would come down and call the pilots and tell them, hey, you're too close to us here, go around to us there. It's called deconfliction, so that they wouldn't sink U.S. ships. Uh, you know, I worked in a lot of different little missions that just required somebody who could speak Arabic. One of the things that terrified me the most in my career was a 30-minute block of time in the run-up to Desert Storm. And I was aboard the, the flagship, and my job, I had been seeing all these indications that the Iraqis were mining the ever-living hell out of the northern Persian Gulf. But the staff that were there they had never seen this before, so they didn't know what the activities looked like. So there's a photograph of a landing craft 40 miles into the middle of the ocean with its ramp down and all these objects under a tarpaulin. And I'd go, mining, and they were like, there's no real evidence of that. And I'm like, why is a, la- who puts the ramp down in the middle of the ocean, right? Later on, I would find, I would prove by going ashore and finding the map of their minefields. 3,000 mines they laid. But in this particular instance, the first Scud missile launched in Desert Storm. And I remember the warning coming from, you know, a national command authority saying, we have a missile launch, ballistic missile launch, Western Iraq. And I was like, ooh, here it is. Game's on, baby. That thing's going to take a course of like 180 to go to Riyadh or 150 to go to Bahrain. That's the bearings from, from this, is what you've trained this for. air base. Yeah, this and I was just like, for. Scud launch. Here it comes. Okay. You know, I know all about Scuds. Uh-huh. And um, I was like, okay, where's it going to go? So these ballistic missiles go into space, by the way, just below the edge of space. And then they fall back ballistically it's like throwing a rock in the air but they calculate where that rock is going to come down and then i realized after about three minutes that the bearing was not 180 the bearing was like 225 to the southwest and i was like what that was that's wrong and i remember these officers who by the way officers don't do the work right Officers sign off on my work. Okay. And so I'm analyzing this ballistic missile launch, and I, and I whip out, a, in my mind, I got a mental map of the Middle East. I pulled out a map and a, and, a, and, a, uh, and a pencil, and I drew a line on 220, and it was Haifa, Israel. And I said, hey, hey, I, I shut up everybody in the room. I said, hey, this is not good. And they were like, what's the matter? I go, that thing's going to Israel. And they were like, yeah, well, you know, the Israelis won't do anything. I go, you don't understand what's happening here. If that thing has a chemical weapon in it, in 15 minutes, it's going to impact. And if it has a chemical weapon in it, in an hour, a nuke is going back to Baghdad. We could be on the cusp of a nuclear war right now. And suddenly everybody was like, "Uh uh-oh, that's not good. And so we literally dialed up Israeli television, right? And we were waiting for the scud to hit, and the air raid warnings go off on Israeli TV, and then, boom, this thing blows up in Haifa, and it's high explosive. We're now we're which is a relief. We're sad. We're relieved that the thing was high explosive, because had it been chemical, and a hundred or two hundred or a thousand Israelis die from a chemical weapon, the Israelis would have nuked Baghdad. That 
is always a possibility when you're talking about a war in the Middle East and a country like Iran. Iran, by the, by the way, they have chemical and biological weapons, and they have the ballistic missile systems that can loft those weapon systems to Saudi Arabia and, 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 and beyond, Amman, Jordan, if they wanted to hit them. So, and they have ballistic missiles that might even be able to, to reach Israel. So whenever we say, oh, we're going to do something, we're going to hit the Iranians, a chain of events could easily lead to where if they believe that you know, the United States or Saudi Arabia is allowing Israel to fly through their airspace. And, you know, who knows? The only way that you can dig out their atomic weapons program is with a tactical nuclear weapon. Because even if we had full air dominance, you just can't get all those tunnels. You're right. And there's only one way to get rid of it for sure. Right. So this is the calculus that I don't see anyone in media or definitely no one in the Trump administration thinking. They think that they're going to get some quick victory like blowing up an empty Syrian airfield because they called an hour in advance and told them and the Russians to leave. That's not Iran, all right? It will be, you know, sun's out, gun's out, you know, and fight will be on. So, happy summer, everybody. Yeah. This, well, is, this, is, this is the real shit that's happening in our world right now, happening in America. And having you on the show right now is urgent. And I, part of why I was excited to have you on the show, Malcolm, is because there's no commercials. Some of this stuff takes time to explain. You yeah. don't get a chance to do that when you're on MSNBC in a quick hit before a mattress commercial, right? Yeah. So we've got to unpack these ideas. But can you turn your focused eye on something specific that's been in the news, which I almost don't want to focus on because it's in part feeding this this narrative that the administration has created but when you saw this grainy video <laughs> that was allegedly Iranians placing a mind or removing a mind it's gone all around right uh, Trump retweeted video right and we have right now a, a freeze at the Pentagon they're not doing press conferences we're not getting briefings like we used to get in the Gulf War about what's happening or even casualty figures oh yeah this is a whole new normal but on a very basic level to your trained eye what did you see well, I can tell you precisely what I saw. I saw half of the intelligence picture. And I, I, I spent a lot of time m monitoring the day-to-day -day activities of Iranian and Saudi and, and Kuwaiti and Iraqi activities of their armed forces. And so there is a normative scale of how they behave. Right? Everybody, you know, and I've worked with special operations, I've worked with special boat squadrons. So the Iranian Revolutionary Guard is just a special boat squadron with 1,500 tiny boats, right? With anti-ship missiles, rockets, and machine guns. That's how many we would have to deal with. But they're spread out all along the coast of a country. So the activity that you would be thinking that would precipitate the grainy video that you see there are things which must occur. So, if the contention is, is that the Iranians went out to oil tankers after they left port, and in the middle of the night, went alongside and put up explosive charges way up midway in the boat, then these activities must occur. Number one, there had to have been a decision-making process which said we need to exercise some sort of retaliation. Uh, that decision-making process of let's do something has to be ordered and passed down to the Revolutionary Guard Command. There's one place that you could gain intelligence because sometimes the CIA and other agencies are very, very good at buying people and things which can get out of hand. I've literally seen that where someone has put down a package of intelligence that I could only describe as unobtainium, right? You look at it, you're like, you own the Minister of Defense? You know, it'd be like somebody coming up with the Pentagon's war plan for, for Guinea-Bissau, right? Okay. Just okay. some obscure war plan that should never leave a vault, and somebody puts it on your table and says, hey, man, that's going to happen in three days. Right. And you're right. like, you guys can be good, despite what the movies say. When you want to be good, 
And I know how that's done, by the way. Yeah. This is some brother goes into a room who isn't a guy from Brigham Young, right? And <laughs> it's someone who's Iranian or kind of, and they just, I call it this. I call it the, the gold bar standard where you walk and you go, so you're offering this to me. And the guy will say, yes, I need all this. And then you just go, I'm going to start putting gold bars on the table. And you start telling me when you can't carry enough of these gold bars out. That's what I'm going to pay you. And you just overwhelm them with the amount of money that they're going to get. Right. And then you say, oh, yeah, and you're going to move to Los Angeles and all your kids are coming too. Right? That's how you get crazy right, intelligence. Right, right. So if this decision was made and it was passed to the Revolutionary Guards, you have an opportunity to acquire that information. Then once it gets to Revolutionary Guard Command, you were in the military, you know how it goes, those orders have to go out. Even if they're secret orders and they go by courier, things are going to occur that are observable, hearable, and detectable. So for example, the, when I actually got a medal for predicting the invasion of Kuwait in 19, uh, 1990, and, the re and I was at a training school in West Texas, and I was watching all of the general day-to-day -day intelligence. And two what we call significant intelligence indicators occurred. The first one was all these, you know, like three divisions of Iraqi army go into the desert near the Kuwaiti border, and the Iraqis are like, oh, we're just doing a training exercise. Then, like 10 million tons of ammunition was being broken out through every weapons depot in Iraq. No one takes the entire war stocks of right. ammunition right. on a trading right. exercise. So same thing with Iran. Yep. Rev guard boats suddenly start weapons lockers open up. You can see that right. when the so doors are open. You've seen this before. You're like, yeah. you know, the, the Tony Romo of warfare here. Right. You're calling the play before before it happens. But going back to the video, Malcolm. What did you see? Well, what did you what think I, it was? What I'm showing you is what yeah. we didn't see. Right. We didn't see. See, we don't know what it was. We didn't see the special operations guys with their wetsuits right. getting onto a craft at night. Right. Right. We should have been watching for right. that. Right. And then, how can you get alongside that tanker unseen? They have watch standers right. who are there, left right. and right, who, who have to see to make sure there's no collisions, who watch the little radar. Yep. Yep. Even if it was swimmers. Swimmers don't do well on a, you know, 50,000 metric ton super tanker moving at seven knots. You still got to be pretty good. If it's a mini sub, you are going to be U.S. capable, right, right. In, in your right. skills. So however it happened, I don't know, maybe one of the crewmen was paid to do it. I don't know. Here's what I do know. The tanker blew up at 0, 0100 at, no, 0, 0312 at night, the first tanker, right? It skyrockets. Now, in the middle of the night, 20 miles off the coast of Iran, there is an explosive plume that's like 400 feet in the sky, right? So, of course, everyone on the Iranian coast is going to go, hey, man, what just blew up off our coast? Even if they did it, the people who are in that town, right, which is called uh, Bandar, Bandar -e Jash, Josh, they're not going to know that. They're going to respond normally, like, let's get our Coast Guard boats and our Rev Guard boats and go out and let's see what see that what's is. Going on. Yep. Two hours later, Rev Guard boats and a patrol craft go out into that area. This is my problem with this timeline. The Pentagon kept saying Iranian boats were operating in the vicinity of these tankers. Yes, two hours after they blew up, 20 miles away from their base. So if I'm in Coronado, That's California, QRF, it could very well be. It's going to be the Coast Guard. Yeah. It's going to be private yachts. It's going to be the local television yeah. channel. You know, everyone's going to respond to that. What you saw with them taking the package off occurred 10 hours after the explosion. So now you've determined that off your coast are these tankers. You've removed the crews off of one of them, and then you send out EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal, to render safe any unexploded ordnance. Even if it was Iranian, it's only common sense that the local guys are going to go, well, wait a minute, that super tanker there could blow up again and spill a billion gallons of oils all over our shore. That doesn't mean that the Iranians didn't do it. Right. It just means what we observed was the post-incident response. All right. It doesn't and mean. So on a very basic level, it's incomplete information. Completely incomplete. And, 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 
And it, it, in this case, in the rare scenario that we're operating in, our commander in chief feels like it's conclusive and asserts that it's conclusive and tweets that it's conclusive and on some levels is, is starting to make a case for war that's been underway for some like like John Bolton for for years. So he, if you want a war, you can create a war, right? And, sure. and, that, and that, whether it's Gulf of Tonkin or this this tanker incident. So uh, there's a lot to digest already in what we've covered here. But let's let's take a step back because okay. this is angry Americans. I say there's a lot to be <laughs> angry about. Sure. If you're not angry, you're not paying attention. Um, you you actually this this fun confluence of events. You and I actually had a lunch once with Ron Perlman. Yeah. Who yeah. was on the show Hellboy. a couple episodes ago? Hellboy. Oh yeah, Ron came so, in. So he was on the show. He was on fire. He was amazing. <laughs> uh, if, if you're listening, you haven't heard that episode. Go back and, and listen to it. But also, imagine me and Ron Perlman and Malcolm Nance having a conversation like this at Tavern on the Green. <laughs> so, like, literally, fancy people in Manhattan are scared shitless because they hear Malcolm talking about this stuff. They hear Perlman talking about Lord knows what. Usually about. Uh, Trump's penis size or something and I'm <laughs> frankly just a pedestrian but you guys both have, have a righteous uh, involvement and concern for where our country sits right? right and I share that with you given all you know given all you see Malcolm Nance what makes you angry oh what makes me angry I'll, I'll tell you right now um, it sounds cliche when I say it because I've said it a few times on air since uh, the, the one thing I forgot to tell you is that you guys see me on MSNBC all the time. I'm the terrorism analyst at MSNBC and the Russia analyst, Trump right. Russia analyst. What offends me the most, what makes me really shaking angry is, is some of the horrible, horrible events that deeply, deeply offend me because they are dishonoring this nation. Uh, my grandfather and my granduncle fought in World War I. My grandfather was a stevedore, and, and my granduncle was a teamster, which means he moved teams of horses. And they would go out together, out to the battlefield. They would take ammo out, bodies back, right? Because that's what they had the black soldiers doing for the most part. Uh, as many black soldiers there as we have Marines today. Mm. And these guys served thanklessly. Uh, by Southerners who even their officers constantly referred to them by the N-word. And they went to France and they served this nation. And Donald Trump would not go to a cemetery where 15 of my grandfather's comrades are buried, black uh, soldiers, um, because it was raining. He has no honor. He has no sense of honor. He is, he is just parroting and mimicking what he believes his followers do. And I don't understand former service members who think Donald Trump is the, should be the commander in chief. He's a five times draft dodger. He lied about getting bone spurs. You know, he's interviewed. He couldn't remember which foot had the bone spurs, right? I ran to the armed forces. My dad was 15 when he joined in World War II. And, and went to the Pacific. His father fought in World War I, my grandfather, and then joined up again in World War II. My great-great-grandfather fought in, world, in the Civil War, and my great-great-granduncle fought in the Civil War and the Indian Wars. There's been a Nance in the military to this day. My niece, by the way, was attacked by an Iranian proxy with an anti-ship missile off of Yemen a year and a half ago. And she's actually in, in the Gulf now. I won't say which ship she's on, but we, we take this job very seriously. We take the, our patriotism very seriously, but I hold no truck for an idiot, okay? This man is so stupid, and he dishonors this nation all the time. It offends me. It offends me. If I was in his presence, I, you know, I'm an old Navy chief. OK, and, it, you know, unlike most other services, a chief in the Navy is a god. When you transition to do E7, E8 and mm -hmm. E9, chief, ma senior chief and master chief, you're just god, god senior and god master. <laughs> and my dad was a master chief and he taught me you have to put it, you have to speak plainly and you have to speak bluntly because the screw up 
that you're going to be ordered to do will be your responsibility if you didn't, what we say, drop your anchors, because our little symbol is the anchor. And I've gotten to a couple of times with this administration where I've literally thrown my anchors down. That means I've had enough of this. And the first one was when he insulted Kazir Khan, the father of, of Humayim Khan, Captain, Captain Khan, a man that gave his life when he saw that his, well, do, he was on headquarters company at an army base and was doing a routine watch section patrol and he saw that car bomb come and he told the men get behind the blast wall and he took seven steps before he was, he was killed in that suicide bombing knowing he wanted to keep his men out of harm and he decided he was going to check this car out himself. And Kazir Khan, whom I've met, his father, who is a d deep American patriot, um, you know, the guy who said, here's my pocket constitution. Right, right. Kazir Khan said in his eulogy of his son, I believed every one of those seven steps was a, a step where he was reaffirming his belief and love in the United States to the moment he gave his life for this nation. That is hardcore mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, soldiering right there. And Donald Trump insulted him and his mother, okay? That's where I get angry. Yeah. I mean, I will not stand for it. God forbid I be in the presence of Donald Trump and he says something stupid, which is almost a guarantee. <laughs> right. So right. that gets me mad. With good reason. With good reason. I don't know your politics. I don't know if you're a Democrat or a Republican. I frankly assume that a lot of people on MSNBC are a Democrat, which is a faulty assumption, okay? It is. Um, I'm an independent. Many of our audience are independent, unaffiliated, or really consider you know, their, their country ahead of their party. You've been critical, I think, appropriately of many of the Democratic candidates. This week, they will take the stage. Yeah. What do you see? What are you, what are you watching for? And is there anybody that you think can handle this challenge? Well, first, let me, let me touch on that. I was a Republican most of my career. I was a Colin Powell style, hard on national defense and national security and relatively squishy on, you know, social things. I, I was never a hardcore, you know, hard right, you know, John Bolton, let's invade every country person. You know, I loved our commanders who, who set the pace, Schwarzkopf. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard Schwarzkopf's speech to West Point. It was one of the most brilliant speeches ever given in military history. It's on par with anything Eisenhower has ever said. Um, and, and so, and, and, and these guys believed in patriotism was maintaining the norms and the dignity of the nation. So I, st I started as a Republican. And then it was the, it was the Monica Lewinsky thing, where it's just like, hey, we're going to impeach the president over consensual, you know, sex. And I thought, oh, man, I'm in trouble <laughs> if we're <laughs> going to get impeached over that. But I'm going to speak now to, on, on your question, but I want the people who are Trump supporters to listen to this, okay? Here's what I'm loyal to, one thing and one thing only, and this will lead to my answer about the Democrats. I am loyal to the Constitution of the United States and nothing else. I'm from Philadelphia, Okay, I lived close to where this nation was founded. Whenever I, you know, the funny thing is, there's a little, there's a little plaza behind Independence Mall, a park called Washington Square, and there it used to be an African American cemetery. And in the Revolutionary War, so many men were dying of disease, uh, it was turned into a uh, a mass grave, and there are a thousand unknown soldiers in that cemetery buried from the Revolutionary mm. War. And there is the original unknown soldier tomb is there, a statue of Washington, and above it it says, um, uh, freedom is a light for which many men have died in darkness. Mm. And I, that sent mm. me into my intelligence career. But I take their death seriously. Mm -hmm. This nation was founded on this. So when I think about what are the Dems going to do here today, there's only one thing they should be arguing about. Will we save the American Republic? Will we save the democracy that has been founded? And by the way, for those of you who come up and say, hey man, we're not a democracy, we're a republic. <laughs> a republic is a democracy in which the rights of the minority party are defended.
Okay, all you Socrateses <laughs> out there. So, you know. So when you look at the stage, right? Well, and and you, <sighs> this week you were, you were very critical of Cory Booker. Yeah. And I think appropriately so. I discussed this in the opening to this show yeah. about how you can always count on the Democrats to eat their own. Sure. Right? And and the Democrats often fall in love. Republicans fall in line. Republicans are stockpiling money behind Trump right now, preparing yeah. for war. And the Democrats look like, you know, the early days of the Iraq war, different tribes fighting with each other. Yeah. Right? While the, while the city burns. So, so again, you know, does anybody emerge here as, as above it? And... You know, how, how do you look at this field, man? Well, first off, 24 people is crazy. Uh, you know, Tom Perez said that we have a really deep bench and they're all better than Donald Trump. That's true, okay, with one exception. There's one person who I don't support at all there. Um, who is that person? That's Tulsi Gabbard. Why? Well, first off, her politics are crazy. Uh, when, when Syria was burning, you know, she was out there speaking relatively positively about ending the war and maybe Assad should be, you know, why are we getting involved in Assad's thing? Assad was committing mass murder. That's why we were getting involved in this thing. And then view, viewing Russia as some sort of stabilizing force, I don't care. I've listened to her. My switches go off. To me, she's the Jill Stein of this thing. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if the Russians backed her to run as an independent. And I'm so, hoping she'll come on this show. I, that's, I want to You know, and I don't want to hear this, things. she was a combat veteran or she was a veteran thing. Well, it's, All right. a, it's important to me. It's important to many people, but I think it doesn't absolve her of responsibility on those issues. And, and I know and she's I since made statements that have sort of refuted that look. Okay, sure. no one asked Tulsi Gabbard to run for president. Sure, sure. You know, the okay, people so who were strong, I'm hoping she'll though. come on the show. I think she, she's offered to come on the show, so I'm hoping we can ask her these questions. Sure. Tulsi's off your Christmas card list. Oh, no. Okay. Not but, you, Tulsi. And it sounds like after this week, I think you said publicly, Cory Booker, Corey is, Booker is off your Christmas card Corey list. Cory Booker is off my Christmas card list because... Because he attacked Biden. Yeah, he broke the Reagan rule, right? That's what the Republicans say, the 11th commandment. Right. Thou shalt not attack another Republican. Well, I think we need that 11th commandment. His attack against Biden was, it wasn't that he, he recognized something which was valid, right? It's that he spent five days hammering it every day. In he's, the press. At the press. He's at 2% and he's decided, I'm going to hurt him personally. And so I tweeted about that. My tweet was very simple. You're done, right? I've gotten to like making official rulings, right? Because I've got three quarters, almost three quarters of a million followers. So, you know, it was him. Um, so of the ones left standing, who do you feel can be, you know, A, if your mission is to, is to stop Trump, who do you think is the best bet? Uh, there are four heavies, I Please. think, right now. Um, and the four heavies that I think that could really have a good chance of becoming president. Clearly, Biden... Biden could walk away with the thing, but suddenly the media has decided the old rules of how you cover people, the way they covered Hillary Clinton, only applies to Democrats, and Donald Trump can do anything and say anything. Right. On the same day that this guy was getting hammered, Biden was getting hammered by Booker, Trump was being called out as a rapist. And right. the media barely covered it, right, and we're going after this African American right. thing. So, okay, so Biden, Biden's one. Who are your other three? Kamala Harris. Okay, could easily be president of the United States. Okay, who else? Uh, Elizabeth Warren could easily be president of the United States, um, and 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 is now showing her smarts the right way. For a long time, I didn't like her, and then I started, you know, listening to her. Right, um, and then I, I, I'm reserving the fourth spot after tonight to see if there's going to be a breakout candidate. Okay. Because you never know. I mean, Hickenlooper could come out and suddenly be the, you know, be the apostle everybody has been, been waiting for. I don't know. There's, there's now two Navy veterans running. So since last we recorded uh, Admiral Joe Sestak, who uh, uh, served in Congress from Pennsylvania yeah. uh, and has run for office before, is now declared he's running, which is... Um, you know, a little surprising late. to say the least and a little bit late so you got to question his, his strategic initiative uh and 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 foresight there but uh and mayor pete mayor pete was a navy intel yeah, guy navy for intel a short guy. period of time yeah. very short period of time went through this interesting commissioning route that now rince Priebus has gone through right a very similar yeah but similar but the guy can speak like seven languages right? and you know he's a cryptologic officer right. I so think. as a navy and, guy how do you yeah. feel about mayor pete well i think mayor pete's a great guy and uh but to be quite honest this week has shown that 
you know, he's got his own issues that he needs to go back to, you know, South Bend or wherever his town is yeah. and resolve those issues. It shows that he's he's just not ready to be president of the United These States. These are the, the issues around racial divisions. Racial divisions in his own town. And when you get the town screaming you out on national television, right. You've got handling issues. of local issues and policing yeah. and, and some of the some of the more important issues. Oh, so, you know, and another yeah. thing is, you know, yeah. I'm a, I'm a middle aged black guy. Right. And according to the statistics, I should be supporting Joe Biden. Well, that's right. You know, I, I, I do support Biden somewhat, but I'm completely agnostic right now. I'll go with whoever whoever comes out punching. And this is the problem. Trump has learned to dominate what we call in information warfare, the meta narrative. Right. No collusion, no obstruction. Yeah. I'm the greatest. That's it. That's all he says. He speaks in five year old terms because a person listening will only hear those terms. The Democrats who come out and will frame him properly, which is continuing criminal enterprise. Right. Moron. Right. Worst president in American history. And of course, insane narcissist. Every one of those things is true and provable. I mean, the man's a pathological liar. He is now documented to have told over 11,000 quantifiable lies. And so your political strategy is, is also grounded in intelligence and in, in information warfare. Yeah. And you feel that this, Give it this, back is, to this him. is the way to win if you were as an intelligence warfare and cryptological expert, if you were the, you know, the James Carville of this situation and you were advising the Democrats, that's the playbook you would have them run. It's not even information warfare. It's, it, that's the old chief's handbook, okay, uh, chief's which, handbook. Is, which is you know, you say something to me, no collusion, no obstruction, I'm going to go back and I'm going to call out and reframe you. Yeah. And that reframing is this. Excuse me, you idiot. Did you just say something? Because we all know you are the stupidest man on the stage and you just hustled 77,000 Americans. And for the next two year, I'm going to call you out for the idiot that you are. And Americans understand frankness yeah. and truth. Yeah, it's just true. that you have to be able to understand, especially those of you who were like me, who were, who were conservative and in the military, you have to look into yourself and understand, are you just going along with him because he's part of your tribe, the leader mm -hmm. of your tribe, mm -hmm. or are you standing for what we all stand for? So I, I want to pull on a thread that we touched on that we that we we don't talk enough about in american media and in politics which is the issue of race yes and can you give me and i, I you know this is a big question but what what is your we talk a lot about race in america yeah we we don't talk much about race in the military yeah and given your very unique position and now your your high profile position can you break it down what is your view where where are we are, are th when it comes to let's simplify and say race relations. Yeah. Is the military better or worse than the civilian world? Oh, the military is way better than the civilian world. But that doesn't mean that there's problems. Look, I worked in buildings with no windows, uh, office, not problems. offices yeah, yeah, yeah. with no doors, right. where you couldn't get into that small cubicle without a cipher lock, right? You have top secret SCI clearance. I had open racism thrown at me in, in that environment. In fact, somebody on, on some, some guy who claimed to have known me, who I'd never met in my life, um, came out there and said, all he did is spent 20 years filing racism you know, complaints. And I thought, y'all need to go look at my DD-214 or that picture with my medals. Clearly, I did not sit around talking about race all day. Right. I was blowing things up that needed to get blowed up. So, you know, but... I think it's a little different in the combat arms. Which, which included, at times, people who were racist in the military. Well, Sometimes yeah. they need to be, you know... Well, I had one guy leave... Administratively blown yeah, up Yeah, I had well. I, I had one guy leave openly, openly racist package on my desk with an object and the N-word written across it. This, I was an E-7. I was a chief in the Navy. All right? That's like, that's like touching the sun. And this guy thought... This guy was an E-6... And he thought that he would get approval from the other white chiefs by insulting me. The hammer came down on him so hard and so fast. But you know what? What, they, was, the, what was the object? I ain't going to say. Okay. But, okay. you know, it was, just, it was just some offensive object. Okay. But they even pulled their punch at the end. 
So he was going to get ad administratively separated, uh, but he was soon to retire. Because it's just one of those, you know, when you get a guy who's like an 18-year E6, you already know there's a problem, right? Yeah. That's a, Meaning he that, hadn't been promoted. He hadn't been promoted. Kind of stuck in a job, yeah. Yeah. And so they didn't bring me to his non-judicial punishment to testify. And I thought, that's unusual. I should have been the first witness, right? So they, they administratively separated him. They didn't but bring him in because they were protecting him. They were protecting him to a okay. certain extent because if I had spoken, it would have been, he would have been kicked out of the Navy completely, mm. no retirement, blah, blah, blah. So he, got a lot, he was allowed to retire. But in the end, those things didn't deter me. My dad was 15 years old and on a troop ship going to an invasion zone with 10,000 white soldiers on it as a black mess maid, you know, mess boy. Okay? You want to, how much racism do you think he got mm. transiting the Pacific? Mm. And then, you know, there was no racism when those Japanese planes were coming, right? Mm. He was the guy humping the ammo up from the weapons locker. Suddenly, you know, I need manpower. When we are in the armed forces, we understand the mission requires technical competence and manpower. There, there, was, an, there was an alarm right. going off. Yeah. We so, are well protected here. We've had to increase security here at the car club because <laughs> Malcolm is here. No way. He has many haters. If you don't follow him on Twitter, you must because it's a whole other level of combat. Um, but, let, me, but, let me make a quick point but, but on please, that. Please, if you could. It wasn't just yeah. race. It was also... It was also Discrimination against gays, discrimination against women. I actually got called in one time to counsel someone because I was a chief. And I was like, who? And he goes, this guy. I won't mention his name because he works at NSA now. And he, I was like, why? And he goes, he's gay. I never noticed. You know why? Because I was busy doing my job. And I opened his folder. And I didn't really know what kind of a linguist he was. He wasn't really deploying on a lot of missions. Because when I opened his folder, I found this guy was like native PhD level linguist. I didn't even know this level existed, right? I was like, you're like freaking Lawrence of Arabia. Mm. This guy could speak near fluent Arabic at a doctorate level. And I thought, I, I looked at it and I was like, what are you doing now? He goes, oh, they, they pulled me off the line and they had just had me transcribing tapes. Mm. And I was like... Go back to transcribing. Mm -hmm. Get out of my office. You're mm -hmm. a level five linguist, mm -hmm. you know? And, it, and they came and they said, did you counsel him? I'm like, no, I didn't counsel him. I sent his happy ass back to work, which is my philosophy. Get to effing work, right? I don't care if you're straight. I don't care if you're gay. I don't care if you're a man. I don't care if you're a woman. I don't care if you're trans. If I need a job done, you will do that job right to the best of your ability and i will help you do that job but i don't i have when i finally went into combat first gulf war and i went ashore okay and there were a million landmines strewn everywhere i had no other linguist with me because they didn't want to let people go because they were firing gay linguists before the invasion of iraq right, right? and they all got hired by the National Security Agency or the CIA. Mm -hmm. Because once they were out, they didn't have a problem with mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. I needed a level five linguist. Mm -hmm. Do you think I had one? No, I had to put up with myself. Mm -hmm. This is where we waste manpower. Same thing as if you got a saw gunner, right? If you had a trans person, I mean, let's look at Chief Kristen Beck, right? Senior Chief Kristen Beck, Navy SEAL, right? Transgendered uh, lady. You know what? When it comes time to do that team guy stuff, right blowy things up and shooty people you're not asking oh excuse me before you go f before you start laying down a base of fire are you gay or straight right. no it's like you better it lay down a base it, of it, fire it, the, the old thing is it, it doesn't matter if you are straight it matters if you shoot straight if you shoot straight and and i think that's a powerful and important message and perspective especially during pride month where the president continues to push a hateful um backward um, really 
counterproductive to our national security trans ban that yeah. I've been openly critical of, you've been openly critical of, many other people have been critical of, and I hope to go deeper on in a future show. Yep. I also want to have you come back on to talk about Russia because we okay. could do hours on that. But every week I ask uh, guests the same question. We've gone into a lot of heavy shit, Malcolm. Can I make one quick question please? about pride? Go ahead. Here's my pride. Navy pride. Yes. Right? Beat Army. That's my only philosophy. I don't care what you are. You and I are getting along are. so well, but now we have to draw a line between my us. And for folks who are wondering, Malcolm did not have a cocktail today, um, we, we, as, we, as is sometimes the, the custom, but he does have a double espresso. Double espresso. So this man, you know, it, it functions mm. at a very high speed, a very high level. My great-great-grandfather and was Army. My okay. great great granduncle so, was army. army. My grandfather was army. The My only time I, the army probably really favors the navy folks is when they need coffee. Right? Yeah, but and the navy guys always have better coffee. But let's go to something about you. Okay. I ask every guest. We've talked in depth about what makes you angry. Yeah. But you are a guy who loves life. You yeah. love you, you know you love your family. You love the outdoors. Um, you love your country. But what's something that makes you happy? You know. Beyond all this, you're in politics, you're in the news, you also have a very rich life outside of your work. What's something that really makes you happy at your core? I'm going to tell you guys something funny, and this is very personal. Um, my, my wife's French-Canadian, uh, and actually she's an American citizen. She was born in West Lafayette, Indiana, and then went home for 42 years, right? Wow. <laughs> so she has this huge French accent. Um, when I came back from Iraq... Uh, unlike you, you were, you were active. I was an intelligence subcontractor. And I actually went there to, to do private security at first, and then I got brought out to do other things with other people. And so while I was doing that, I was riding around Iraq in a BMW 750i. Hmm. Right. That was my that was hmm. my that was my pers armored personnel. That's not what I had. <laughs> unarmored personnel vehicle. Well, you know, if you. Then again, you didn't have to go out in the middle of the night to safe houses to check on the guards because they claimed they saw a genie. True. <laughs> oh, True. You True. know, that was, that was the most dangerous thing I did in Iraq was get in a BMW at 3 a.m. Mm. Right? And I was like, hellfires are coming. Okay. I'm going to have an AC-130. It's going to shred me any minute now. Okay. So when I got back from, my, my, from Iraq, and I worked in Iraq on and off over 10 years, by the way, um, the first time I was there for a year, and uh, I came home to Washington, I was getting married, um, and the decompression process was so different than when I was in the military. When you're in the military, you come back to a base, you have all your debriefs, you, you, know, you turn in your equipment, then you go back to work on Monday in some slough job. This was civilian subcontractor life. Uh, I came back, did my debriefs and everything, and then it's like, oh, going home now, play with the Beagles. Um, my wife took me out to breakfast in, in Adams Morgan. You, you might know that in yep, D.C. In DC yep. You know Cafe Trist in D.C.? There's a cafe there called Cafe Trist. And next door is a diner called Diner. And I sat down there, and I started having corned beef hash. Mm -hmm. And I realized, I, I just started, I didn't even know I was crying. I was crying in this place, and she's just like, what's the matter? I go, I'm in a safe place. Mm -hmm. I'm safe. I'm safe. I mean, that's what I kept saying. It's just like, there's no car bombs are going to go off here. I was constantly primed for car bombs. I've been in the blast radius of three suicide car bombs, including the famous Assassin's Gate. I was in line when the Assassin's Gate car bomb went down, and I was in an armored Jeep Cherokee, and I didn't know that the bomb had gone off till the two people in front of me literally tumbled away, right? Wow. And I thought we had been hit by a truck. So I just thought, holy cow. That night, she took me to Cirque du Soleil. Wow. Right? And I the, thought the corned beef hash was going to be the surprise, but there's even more. In the middle okay. of Cirque du Soleil, I was so overwhelmed with happiness. Cirque du Soleil's Alegria, by the way, which is the best of all Cirque du Soleil's. And um, I just was, the word is ebullient, right? Where happiness ebullient. bubbles up in you. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I don't I go it. back to the safe house tonight. I, love I don't it. have to strap nothing on me. There's no grenades on me. There's, you know, I don't have to do weapons checks in the morning, and I definitely don't have to wake up the goddamn guard. So, you know, the Iraqis, I, I only work with Iraqis. 
So that's, that was the happiest moment, you know, other than my wedding, but the happiest moment in the last 20 years. Thank you for sharing that. That's yes. really, I think it's inspiring and it's beautiful and I hope it gives people a lot of perspective. I want to, I want to finish with, with a question I haven't asked you yet okay. because you are a very fascinating guy. Um, what w- Mar- Malcolm Nance, mm. what was your first car? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I wish it was something sexy. So it wasn't. Uh, I was I was stationed at NSA, and uh, I just hated getting the shuttle bus. So I was like, I'm gonna learn to drive. <laughs> so I had to learn to drive with my my brother who lived in Alexandria taught me to drive. And then I went out and I bought. What year was that? Nine. 19- 1985 Honda Accord, right? I took a safe car. Wow. They're sexy now, you know, but back then they were like these, they were like mommy movers. What color was it? It was champagne, man, because that was the Sh- cheap, that was the cheap cover, color, <laughs> champagne. right? Champagne. <laughs> champagne colored 1985 Honda Accord. Did you ever think that when you were driving around that champagne Honda Accord years later, you'd be in a BMW flying around in Iraq? Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, the most dangerous, you and I know, the most dangerous thing you could do in Iraq is get in a vehicle. That's true. Yeah. All right? But yeah. I did have some good cars out there. I, I you, you know, I had Jeb Bush's armored, uh, armored Ford Expedition. No, Excursion, the I big one. And it was a huge six-ton armored vehicle that we had bought. And I used to do the, I used to do the Green Zone to the airport run down route irish and i used to take that and i I would do that run personally i was head of security for a u.s government subcontractor and i would do that run personally you had to put on all your armor Mm -hmm. your helmet and everything and i had a minimum speed on route irish 100 miles per hour i would get this six ton armored per armored luxury limousine up to 100. It would I, wish vi- there, I wish there was video of that. It would start vibrating at 100 was, miles per we hour. We have to do, if, if, you'll, <laughs> if you'll allow us, after this show, we'll have to post on Twitter whatever pictures of all these many. Inter- you, you've got the widest got spectrum some. of interesting vehicles of any guests we've had on, on so far. So I'm so That's glad That's crazy. We dug I'm not a car you. guy. Yeah. I just it, got you, cars. You got, even the pictures you were showing me on your phone today are pretty fucking amazing. I mean, the six wheel thing is bonkers. We'll, we'll, if you're comfortable, we'll post a picture of that. But um, before we wrap what has been a fascinating and dynamic conversation, I'm, I'm so grateful for your time, especially given all that's going on in the world. We haven't checked our phones, which is good, because I don't want to know what's going on outside for, for a little while. But as is tradition, I have some gifts for you, uh, and I will, I will start with the, with the easy ones. Um, are these are these lady shoes? No, they're not lady <laughs> shoes. You're giving Malcolm a black bag, and inside um, oh. we have some of the the brand new Angry Americans merchandise. Oh, we swag. now have blue and red. Again, Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter. Made in the USA by veterans. So Malcolm, I hope you'll enjoy those this summer when you're driving your vehicle or you're hanging out upstate. Um, big shout out <laughs> to like the guys that. from from Oscar Mike. Um, and then also in the bag, angry. yeah, you know, I think, I think that's appropriate. It says angry on the front. We've also got some new ones that kind of look like a flag that have the lightning bolts. I like it. Very That'll, comfortable. Check them out. That eclipses my real time with Bill Maher t shirt yeah. 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 You know, Bill Maher, you know, always gives me a don't t-shirt forget the mic. I think it's on your chest, but uh, see, you're a pro. I think it's still working. Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't told people this, but, uh, Bill Maher takes good care of guests. Yes, he does. I mean, most guests. Oh, peeps, ho- hold yo. on with the peeps. Bill Bill Maher actually is when, the only time I flew first class, two times in my in my life for a long period was was to Iraq. Yeah. And to Bill Maher because HBO flew me out first class and they would have a guy always pick me up who was a, a Russian vet from Afghanistan. Yeah. And he would pick me up at the airport and Bill Maher, love him or hate him, they take they take good care of their guests and Wait. the party afterward is not to yeah, be missed. It's either. not bad. Right? Wait, but you thought a C-17 was first class? No. No, <laughs> no. I'm an Army guy. I didn't know the difference. And then last, so you, now you've got the peeps. I got peeps. He's got every, peeps, every y'all. Every guest this season Look has at that. gotten to choose between yellow, blue, or pink peeps. And I ran out of blue. So what would you pink, yellow, blue, or pink, Malcolm, and why? 
In terms of peeps? Yeah. Oh, I'm a hard. Is, I'm a hard. You know, you're 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 an intelligence analyst guy. I'm a you traditionalist. Know, tells us though, about man. you. You got to go with yellow peeps because yellow peeps are exactly it. I think I've got some three-year-old yellow peeps in my house because you know what? These are apocalypse food. This <laughs> this is everyday <laughs> carry. This will last for years. And you know what the best combat meal in the world? No. When, you know when you get your care packages? No. My wife and kids sent me like bunches of care packages in Iraq, right? So what is the best Sl combat meal? Stale peeps yeah. in a hot cup of coffee. Stale peeps in a hot cup? You know, Sarah Jessica Parker called the yellow peeps the OG of peeps. That's right, OG. And now you've called it, you know, the ultimate survival food. That's right. And now the worlds are coming again. And lastly... Wait, I get both, right? Yes, sir. Hell and yeah. lastly, <laughs> we have uh, every week oh. I pick an American-made product. Um, and I go to the liquor store and I try to find something that speaks to me for this guest. And one of the things I know about you is that you are very passionate about the upstate region of New York. I am. And it is blossoming for folks that don't know. It's, it's become this new landscape and it's where, you know. A lot know, of distilleries. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of, lot of distilleries. So I came up with a, with a choice that I think would speak to you. Looks like gin. It looks like gin, but it's not gin. Use the mic if you don't mind so they can hear you, Malcolm. Oh, Hudson, New York corn whiskey. All so right. It's a New York made whiskey. Cow, powerful this stuff. This is great alcohol. It's powerful stuff for a man with a powerful mind. And it comes from your area. And I'm reading the history of the Hudson whiskey yeah. and, and learning that, that corn grain whiskey is something that used to be a founding part of our history. Absolutely. And so I hope you enjoy that this summer. I have a liquor cabinet. It's actually a liquor chest in my dining room. You must. If, if, and if, I've got liquor from all over the world. I have cookery, I have cookery uh, whiskey from Nepal. I have uh, like scorpion whiskey from Thailand. I want to do a show from, from your Thailand. house and we can just do Dude, liquor tasting from Malcolm's Adventure. I'm going to tell you a, a, a funny story before we go. Please. I don't have a man cave. I have a man skiff. A man skiff. It says man skiff and goat locker. On the, on the For civilians, tell them what that means. A, a skiff is a sensitive compartmented information facility. It's where all the spies hang. And so I got a man skiff, and when it's done, it'll actually be rated to secret. All right. So I would love, I, and I maybe, maybe, maybe next season we can do the show down, from man. deep inside that you secure can come to the man area, skiff. and we can go through your whiskey collection. But on a very serious note, Malcolm, I'm grateful for you joining us. Um, you are a great example of why this show exists. If you're not angry, you're not paying attention. You are paying very astute attention to the most important issues facing our country and facing our globe. You've been a voice of truth. You've been challenging power, and you, you've really dedicated your life to service. And, and I, your, your history, your family history, I think, is an inspiration for all Americans. And I'm humbled to have you here, especially as we go into July 4th. Uh, and I'm just grateful for you, man. Thank you for joining us on the podcast and for, and for all you do. Thank you. It's great to be a very angry American. <laughs> <laughs> and follow Malcolm on Twitter. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is a ferocious and entertaining uh, world that he engages in. He does not shy away from fights. Your books, can you tell people about your books, where they can find them? Yeah, the three books on Russia, are, the first one's Plot to Hack America. That came out six weeks before the election. And if you'd like to see how the intelligence process works, I predicted everything that's in the Mueller report before the election, and it was actually published on the same day that the CIA turned in an identical report to President Obama. Wow. And except that my, I called the Russian operation Operation R Lucky 7. They called it Operation Grizzly Step, which is actually a better name. Uh, and then there's the plot to betray, uh, no, the plot to destroy democracy, how Putin and his spies are damaging America and dismantling the West. And the new one comes out this fall, the plot to betray America, how Team Trump compromised national security. Uh, and so those are my three books on Trump Russia. I have six other books we'll on counterterrorism and uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS. Uh, two, you know, three of my books have been on the Times bestsellers list. So uh, go, go get those. We'll but post them on the Angry Americans website, angryamericans.us, and on all our social media properties, and we'll continue to share all of Malcolm's important work. Thank you again, man. My pleasure, I bro. I hope you have an awesome summer, despite the fact that we're on the verge of war. At least we will have lots of peeps okay. and corned beef and some damn good liquor. And, Since may, we're, and, it, and may, if things start really getting crazy, I may have to come up to your house. Since we're getting recalled to active duty, let's go hit that range. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're, we're going to go hit the range and get ready for recall to active duty. Thank you for joining us for an awesome conversation with the great Malcolm Nance.